if it can't be you are you are live okay great thank you thanks everybody for being here uh, we may have a couple more folks trickle in um, we'll see but i think we have critical mass to have a conversation uh, i'm chief of comprehensive planning eric lashinsky uh, reached out to most of you directly and um, to, to participate in this second focus group for our public water access plan We've been working with the Volpe Center. Uh, Anthony is here from Volpe Center. We've been working with them since May on this plan. And then we have some other partners. Well, Brian Callahan from the mayor's office and then Eddie Gonzalez um, from National Park Service who are helping to fund this, this project. Um, I just wanted to start with introductions for, for you know, everybody knows each other. Um, and then we can kind of get into the conversation. I have a few, just very few introductory slides that I'll do after the introductions, but let's go around. I know I um, I mentioned the other sort of team members here, but Anthony, why don't you <coughs> introduce yourself? Actually, Brian, why don't you go ahead since you're another person with the city and then we can go to Anthony. Hi everybody, I'm Brian Callahan in the mayor's office. <coughs> hey. Good morning, everyone. My name is Anthony Jones. Uh, it's good to see some of the faces again. I work with the I work with the Volpe Center, and I've been helping out with this Annapolis water uh, inventory project since last year. Um, I'm looking forward looking forward to a good conversation, and you know, I'll pass on off to MPS. Hello, everyone. I'm Eddie Gonzalez. I'm director of partnerships and grants for the MPS Chesapeake office. Uh, so we're really invested in uh, starting to look at uh, community level uh, work towards public access. So really happy to be involved with the uh, city of Annapolis. Thanks. All right. Um, let's go to, I guess, uh, I'm just going to go around here um, in the order there on my screen. And if you have an affiliation with an organization, just share that. But Maybe just kind of share if you have any other connection to the waterfront, um, be great to know. Uh, Barbara, why don't you go ahead? Good morning, uh, I'm Barbara Killinger. I've been working the last two years with the city parks. I've been renovating Horn Point Park. Uh, so it's coming along and we just recently were able to remove two uh, aggressive invasive tree of heavens, uh, the city cooperated with us on having those removed. So uh, I really am concerned about waterfront access because we have a lot of people using our park. We have one of the few parks with a beach and a lot of uh, paddle boarders and kayaks and things come to use the beach as well as people with dogs and so forth. So that's why I'm here. All right, glad you could be here. Um, Francesca, you're on mute. Uh oh, okay. We can um, go ahead to Gabby and we'll come back to you, Francesca. Can you hear me now? Oh yeah, go ahead. All okay, right. sorry. We got I got my new computer and my headset's all messed up. Um, so I'm Francesca King. Um, I grew up in Annapolis, um, and I moved back uh, about six years ago and live in the city now. Um, I work for Watershed Stewards Academy, and we train community leaders um, on like stormwater pollution solutions. Um, and I also am, as of this past summer, a member of the Recreation Advisory Board for the City of Annapolis. Awesome, uh, Gabby. Hi everyone, um, Gabrielle or Gabby Rafi. Uh, I'm manager of equity and community engagement at Chesapeake Conservancy. And I also work closely in partnership with the National Park Service, Chesapeake Bay office. Um, I do a lot around equity and public access um, and inclusion. Um, so I lead a bilingual ranger program. Um, we are present in Anne Arundel County at Sandy Point, um, increasing equitable access to the Bay and um, was a part of some of the initial in-person surveys of the, um, the water access in Annapolis, uh, but I live in Baltimore. Cool, thanks for being here. Uh, Randy? 
Hello, my name is Randy Rao, uh, Kenyatta Rao Jr. Uh, my family's been living in Annapolis for over 175 years. I'm the owner and founder of Breaking Boundaries Environmental LLC. Also, I'm the director and coordinator of the Sea Stream program uh, at Smithsonian Environmental Research Center for Chesapeake Research Consortium, which is an internship program for underserved uh, people of color and first generation college students. Um, I also um, am the chair of the City of Annapolis Environmental Commission. And I was, you know, my focus has always been on equity. I was the first ever diversity and inclusion officer for the Maryland State Department of Natural Resources in Annapolis. And uh, so the charge has always been for me all about how do we build social equity and how do we get this right the first time around um, and really use this opportunity to pour some of these financial uh, wealth resources into communities and people who have traditionally and historically not received those uh, amounts of resources. So just a lot of, a lot of you know, good things that could come from a lot of this development and building some capacity where it may need to go um, to get us to that sustainability uh, goals that we had. So. Thank you, I agree. Uh, Naya. Good morning, everyone. My name is Naya Curtis. Um, I wear multiple hats in the city. I've been here my whole life. Um, so I'm a local Annapolitan. I'm the Ward 3 liaison, so I work very closely with Alderwoman Rhonda Pendell Charles. I'm the owner of Eye Opening Photography, a local photography business here. I also work with a plethora of youth in the community and other community members. Um, and I write curriculum along with my partner, Mr. Jonathan Hill, um, called the Nijon Curriculum for the youth. Appreciate you being here. Um, I see former Mayor Moyer has joined. Thank you for being here, Ellen. Um, you want to go ahead? You're on mute. Come back. Come back to you. Um, Montserrat. Hi, good morning. I am Montserrat Pizarro. I work with Gabby. Um, I'm one of the bilingual rangers. Uh, most of my work revolves around youth, uh, doing junior ranger programs, stuff like that, parks. And I was involved in the site inventory and analysis process of this project. Glad you could be here. Um, Mayor Moyer, looks like you're unmuted now. Hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, I am I am a retired person. I am a retired mayor of the city. And I was also the, uh, the mother of the street end parks. And so the street end parks that you see in the city, the majority of them were created by me, either as, a, or as my initiatives, either as an alderman or as mayor. So water access street end parks is something I have experience in. Glad you could be here. Uh, Greg? Hi, uh, I'm Greg Brennan. I'm a board member of the Spot Creek Conservancy and uh, Master Watershed Steward. I've lived in uh, Annapolis, Eastport for about 13 years. And uh, I have a, I row on the Severn two or three times a week on, on my car top. So water access is important to me personally and professionally. Thanks for being here. Uh, Bill, I think you're the last. Hi, I'm uh, Bill Borwig and I uh, live in uh, Eastport. I'm a board member of the ACA. Uh, I'm actually a docent that takes people inside the uh, Thomas Point uh, show a lighthouse. Uh, I do oyster restoration at uh, EYC. Um, we have oyster cages there. Um, I've been looking at water access in recent years and the loss thereof, uh, uh, not only in Eastport, but around the city. And um, I, I'm trying to preserve what Ellen Moyer, Moyer has started, uh, but also I see erosion in other places where we lost water access at you know, SAYC. Uh, we no longer can go in the water at, at the Wells Cove where we used to be able to do that. 
I see where uh, CAT uh, Stand Up Paddleboard just lost their lease to launch paddleboard uh, out of uh, uh, Ellen Moyer Park. Um, and uh, I just see this constant erosion of these uh, water access in these smaller parks. And I like to try to not only maintain them, expand them, and label them um, is really what I'm all about. So thanks for uh, thanks for allowing me to participate. Uh, thank you for being here. And I just want to say that there's a few people who were at our first focus group, just in the interest of transparency of Bill and Mayor Moyer. Um, I think that, I don't know, Randy, were you at the first one? I think you, you were, yeah. Um, the questions are, we're, we're looking at something different in this conversation. We, we wanted to, the first focus group was more about the big, kind of big, broad questions. We wanted to kind of dive into some details in this one and, and really talk about what, like the standards for our water access should be to be equitable and inclusive and, and you know, make sure the waterfront is inviting and um, comfortable for everybody. And so, you know, to, I know we can still talk broadly, but I mean, in this conversation, I mean, any details, any specific ideas would be greatly appreciated. Um, so we, we do have some questions, but before we do that, I just wanted to um, to share a few overview slides just for, for those who haven't been as engaged in our process. Um, so let me share my screen. And, you know, I also wanna say that um, we have a chat feature, you know, on these Zoom meetings, people should feel welcome to comment in that. We'll, we'll save the transcript. Um, we are, uh, recording this conversation and we're also broadcasting on the city's YouTube channel. And, you know, I think we want to share this conversation as well, like we did with the first um, focus group. So uh, I just have four slides for you. This is, um, this is our map of current water access in the city. It, it may not include every, we, we keep learning about some small locations here and there, but what this includes is in, in blue, the blue dots are all of the city of Annapolis parks, the ones that we manage as a city. The orange ones are public access easements that aren't really formally parks yet. Um, and then you have purple are planned city of Annapolis parks. So you have the Altonia Cars Beach um, over by across from Ellen Moyer Nature Park. There's one that should be on here that's not, that's the Gateway Park on Rel Boulevard is, is an initiative um, that's kicked off recently. And then, and that would be on College Creek. And then we have privately managed open space. So this is sort of, you could think of the St. John's waterfront, um, St. Luke's off of Bay Ridge Avenue. Um, there's, uh, although it's technically city owned, you know, you have uh, behind Bates, there's the, Annapolis Children's, uh, Chesapeake Children's Museum, I think it's called, and Thompson Street um, downtown is technically privately managed today, although it, it functions a lot like a public park, and we're trying to make formalize it as such right now. But it, believe it or not, um, we didn't have this kind of map until recently. Um, a lot of these sites are managed differently, and, and uh, even within the city, some are managed by our recreation and parks department. Some are managed by our public works department. Uh, so we wanted to kind of get this baseline. Some have names that some people use, others don't. We wanted to be as consistent as possible. And so this has been, um, it sounds kind of trivial, but this has taken a bit to get to this point. Um, and I think it's very helpful to kind of see where that concentration of existing water access points are. A lot of these residents may not know or even hear. Um, they're in neighborhoods uh, that people may not go through regularly. And so and now, you know, the idea is that these should be more visible, more identifiable uh, places. Um, we also did a map for the, the area, the broader Annapolis area that kind of shows the context of where we are and, and the other ways of getting to the water, uh, public locations, and some are county managed. There's some private 
sites, uh, quasi public, like the Smithsonian, um, you know, you have uh, the, the big Annapolis water works park is outside of the city, but um, city owned and that's on the broad Creek. Um, so <clears throat> say that again. Is that a quick question? Yeah, yeah, go for it. So is there any charge or emphasis to build or develop new parks or is the emphasis to uh, pour into or add capacity to the ones that are already existing? Because I just noticed, it's just I'm just looking at it, mm -hmm. uh, all of them are on the right side of this, <laughs> of, of the right side of this, the perimeter. Um, and so is there any opportunity to build up some on the left side of the perimeter more so that it would maybe make it look a little bit more uh, balanced. You mean like uh, up river? Of the, no, no, no. In this perimeter where you have the black perimeter. Oh, the, the city boundary there. Yeah. Right. Because they're all on the right side. So, and then it's I also true. made me think about, you know, where the more wealthier pockets of the city are. And that's also kind of where all the parks are. Um, so, is there any opportunity, is there any thought to try to develop some to balance it out more on the left side of this black perimeter there? Well, just a, just a comment, you notice that the blue dots are along creeks. Mm -hmm. And so um, on the left side, there are very few, there are creeks, but there are very few that come into the city boundaries. There are some that could be good places for, um, if you're talking about water access, that could be utilized but not many. So it, th that has been a challenge in the past, but it's it's definitely in the scope of this project to be looking at those opportunities. <laughs> Even if they're outside of the city limits, we have a really great relationship with Anne Arundel County right now. Um, and they're, they're in the same boat, uh, if you will. Um, they, they need to increase public access countywide as well. And there, there's an enormous amount of pressure on them to do that, people are asking for it. Um, there's only four boat ramps, you know, that you could um, drive a, a trailer into the water, um, and two of them are in Annapolis. So um, they're they're really looking for other places as well. And and so I think we are. There's a part of this project is trying to inventory all of those potential projects and prioritize them. And, and a few have come out of the woodwork just since we've been working on this, um, not on that left side, like you say, Randy, um, but on the creeks that, you know, like Weems Creek only has one public act. It's Tucker Street. Um, Alderwoman O'Neill created a new a resolution passed the city council just a few weeks ago for a Tolson Street park, which is um, a couple blocks away that goes down to Weems Creek. And so that'll be another one. Um, but, you know, we're, we're kind of looking everywhere we can, I would say. And so, yeah, yeah. It, it'd be really cool to see a drone footage of all of this. Uh, and if you don't know anybody, I know a guy, a friend of mine that does mm -hmm. his own cool drone footage, real high HD stuff, but it'd be, love, it'd be <laughs> lovely to see an aerial shot of, uh, especially some towards the middle and the left side that don't have as much, uh, things going on, but maybe some aerial footage uh, with a drone would give us some real idea, con conceptualizing thinking uh, ability, you know. Hey, Eric, uh, quick clarification question. Is this map showing all the parks in the city or just those with water access? The, the other parks are the green. So some are small and you're not gonna see them, but it is showing all the parks in the city. Um, in, in this light green color. And then the water access locations are kind of with the, the dot symbol. Um, so. Okay, so to Randy's comment, it's not just that there isn't as much water access on the left side, it's just that there isn't as much green space yeah. in, in general. That's a, that's a good good pickup, yeah. yeah that's okay. a, I'd like to echo uh, Randy's comments. I mean, you know, if you look at the South, again, the South Shore Spa Creek, I mean, there's a dearth of access points um, and on the north side, there's all these floating docks. We could also, even the, the few uh, water access spots we do have on the South Shore at Spa Creek or even on Back Creek, we could be adding floating docks. There's a ton of floating docks in the Murray Hill neighborhood, but 
we don't have a single floating dock, public floating dock in uh, on Back Creek. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, Eric, on your maps, do you also include the conservancy sites those land, that are under the land trust? We do not. Not on this one. We should. We have that stuff mapped, and that would be worth including because uh, some of those are, you know, not public today. I mean, they're they're publicly protected, but the access isn't there, and that might. That's a good point. Um, right. It's publicly protected because I don't. I don't see the city-owned property. Uh, along College Creek mm -hmm. on this, you know, on this map. Good point. I um, appreciate all these are excellent um, pickups on this map and how to improve it. Um, let me just, just want to get into the actual the questions. I just wanted to sort of say that um, kind of a point of departure for this project is that we have a, a variety of really great water access locations today, like a real range of places on the left, you can see some of those. Um, we have just as many barriers and, it, and it's things that are kind of innocuous, like, like waterfront dining to some, I, I be the first one to say, we, I think we could use more waterfront dining in the city, but we can't have all water access be through a restaurant. And, you know, the city did pass um, a code change last year that requires unconditional public water access at any new restaurant that is created on the waterfront. So I'm pretty proud of that. But the water taxi, for example, is a great service for tourists primarily. It's not very affordable for residents. Um, they have their costs they have to cover and but um, the price point is something that it doesn't make it really an accessible thing for a lot of residents. Um, you know, we have the marinas are kind of like the economic lifeblood of the city, but they also provide a challenge for water access, public water access. And then you have environmental issues like the flooding that you can see here at Fifth Street and uh, all the sediment buildup on the bottom right at Hawkins Cove. Um, and then you have upper left HOAs. You know, there's a lot of that in the county, uh, kind of private parks. Uh, there's some in the city and, you know, we have to kind of work around that. So um, that's kind of what we're up again. I mean, that's kind of the big reason for addressing these issues in this plan. And then with Volpe leading the way, we, we did do a, a needs assessment. We, we went through every single existing water access location, publicly managed water, even some of the um, easements that aren't really parks per se today, like um, Wells Cove. Um, and we were able to come out with a ton of data from that. It was a kind of a blitz. We went through all these sites in a day with um, the roving rangers uh, from Chesapeake Conservancy and National Park Service helped a lot. And uh, out of all the data, I mean, these are four things that popped out at me that I think of as kind of equitable access indicators, just in terms of getting people to these sites. Um, public transit, we know we're constrained on a lot of city streets, but trying to get, you know, like a quarter mile is a fair five minute walk from a site, but um, many of them don't have that. Um, the trail connections are limited um, to many of these sites and we can definitely improve on that. Um, sidewalks generally good, although some sidewalks may not be ADA accessible and there may be uh, you know, utility conflicts you know, in the middle of the sidewalk, but generally our sidewalk network gets to the water and then the signage is a big, big need this um, when I say wayfinding directional that's kind of everything from just a something telling somebody that this is a public site to how to get to other places um, or how to get to this particular site if it's water access say if it's embedded in a neighborhood and people aren't familiar with that neighborhood they're not going to find that site without appropriate signage so um, this was my take on the data, I mean, this is kind of a starting point. 
I guess for me, the big question is, well, when you get to one of our waterfront parks, then what, you know, what, what should be there to make it inviting and accessible and um, inclusive. And, you know, so that's kind of the point of departure for this conversation. And uh, I'm going to hand it over to Anthony at this point. Um, I'm going to pull up, we, we use um, the Google Jamboard as a way to capture feedback. Um, so we basically have only a handful of questions and um, just kind of thought about breaking the ice with this one. <laughs> I'll hand it off to you. Hey, yeah, and so in, in understanding that we're looking to, you know, to figure out where the, the access is and how to make these parks, you know, more inviting, more accessible for everyone within the city based either on race, economic, or disabled status. Um, you know, we're trying to get this icebreaker question to figure out, you know, when you visit like a, a waterfront access site or a park within the city of Annapolis, um, where do you normally go to? Or is it within the city or is it outside the city and the county? Um, and in particularly, what draws you to that area and, and what means how do you get there? Um, and thinking about, you know, do you take a car? Do you utilize the transit? Are you are you utilizing your boat so that you may have um, just to kind of understand and ground us in this thought process? And so I'd like to hear, you know, what your thoughts are and we start from anyone. I go where wherever rich people aren't. That's what I think about originally, initially. Um, I try to think about where it's not a lot of rich people at. Um, because usually for me, it's kind of got a direct association with snobbiness or uh, issues or what are you doing here type of thing. So um, if I, I try to typically myself, I try to find pockets of places where I know it's people who uh, maybe look like me or have ownership in that area. Um, so that way, when they see me or people see me, it's not automatically looked at as like I'm an outsider. People around this mm -hmm. access point look like me and are owners in that area and have a stake there. So it doesn't kind of have the same uh, feeling of like I'm out of place or not in the right place or this could go wrong in a second. Um, and so, or the police may be called on me, which all of this stuff has, has happened to me before. Um, so I'm not going off just feelings or emotions. This is actual real things that have happened. So. Right. And those are definitely, uh, valid comments and concerns, because if you are feeling that way, there are other people in the community that are also feeling the same way. Um, you know. <gasps> being able to one have ownership in the parks that you visit uh even if they are public parks in another neighborhood as a as someone as a resident of and a taxpayer within the city you do have the right to be there and to be accepted there and then you know the key words of diversity uh within those parks as well uh naya and then greg thank you so, like I said before, I deal with a lot of youth in the city of Annapolis. So I go to places where um, it's also accessible for the youth, where they can learn um, about the city and even outside of the city, because a lot of the youth that I work with, um, a lot of them haven't even um, been out of to places outside of their neighborhoods. So um, I usually take them to places where they've never been um, in the city and outside of the city, not necessarily even in the county. We've been to other counties, um, in the mountains, things like that, so that they can learn about all the areas. And when you're visiting those places, are y'all utilizing, you know, personal modes of transportation or, uh, you know, transit and things of that nature to get there? And even within the city, what are you taking to get there? Personal transportation. Personal transportation. Yes. Hello, hello. 
Uh, I got Brad, great hands up and then press kids. And then, uh, Ms. Moore, I can take you. Um, if I'm walking the dog, we'll go across Bay Ridge Ave to uh, Parkwood, which is a community on Back Creek. And they have a, their HOA did a living shoreline a few years ago. Mm -hmm. um, but I do that. I do have friends that have been yelled at there for being in the neighborhood, even ones that were renting in there. Uh, so we happen to have, we know one of the former presidents of the HOA. So I have his name in my back pocket to drop if anybody questions us. Um, when we go down there, we try and, you know, keep a low profile, uh, stay off the dock because probably expect to get yelled at for that. Um, other than that, we'll we'll go a little bit further to um, St. Luke's Living Shoreline. Uh -huh. And that's a beautiful place to be. Um, if I'm putting the boat in a boat in the water off of my car, I will go to the Maritime Museum. Right. Which has parking early in the morning at least and um and has a beach to put in. No. And and I have a membership at that museum just in case I get yelled at. Okay. It's a uh, uh, kind of keen on and want to clarify with the that living shoreline of the HOA, um, the park across the bridge. Uh, is that publicly owned or is it uh, owned by the probably uh, not publicly owned by HOA property? Right. I know um, there are some parks, you know, they have designations that are potentially public, but they're supported and sponsored by HOAs. And so just to make that clarification, um, you know, as you say, with ownership, some people feel like because we put money into this, it is ours, but it's also shared to the public. And so this is make sure we get that and educate people appropriately. Um, Francesca? Yeah, so I live in Ward 6. Um, so I walk to Truxton Park a lot um, and like walk on the trails there um, or walk down the ramp um, down where like the water taxi stop is. Um, I had a baby this year though. So now that I have a stroller with me, I can't go on the trails anymore. Um, and I used to rent a house um, on Chester Avenue, like down in the peninsula part, um, but I can't really get there with the stroll anymore because there's so many utility poles like on the sidewalk the whole way down. So that's pretty tough. Um, and so I'll sometimes walk across Bay Ridge Avenue. It might be the same place that Greg's talking about. I've never looked at the sign or anything, but there's like a neighborhood there. Um, but I've seen that there's like a little park, but it's got signs, it's like private property. Um, so that, yeah, that's one thing. And then I would love to take the water taxi to go downtown. When we lived on Chester, we would walk downtown like all the time. Um, but it's, I think $6 or $7 a person. And it has to be three adults on the water taxi for it to come all the way to back to Spa Creek or Back Creek. Um, and so it's like not cheap to get, um, downtown with the baby. Okay, uh, and Ms. Moyer? Um, yeah, the, 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 let's just talk about the existing street end parks, those little blue dots, mm -hmm. <clears throat> because they're all different and they have different personalities, uh, different features about them. Some of the comments that you made really refer to larger park areas, but so it might make, make some <laughs> sense to ad identify, um, you know, to more closely identify them, for instance, the end of Chesapeake Avenue water access and the park across from Davis's pub have a different kind of personality about them in terms of use than perhaps some others. Um, they're all public property. And so well, while many were are small thumbnail, I'll just call them tiny parks, um, they were uh, done under the, the uh, long ago Lady Bird Johnson, um, and the national park philosophy that, you know, everybody should have uh, within less than 10 minutes walk a place where they could be in the outdoors. And so utilizing um, 
of utilizing what you had for open space or a place where you could just sit mm -hmm. uh, and not do much else and or launch a boat as you could at Davis's and or Chesapeake Avenue easily. Um, you know, were, you know, are looked at differently. The, the park at the end of 6th Street uh, on Back Creek isn't really a park. It's a place where, you, where there is a ladder so that people that come in from the water can come up, can, come, uh, can get out of their boat and come up. And at one time there were bicycles there so that <laughs> you could take a bicycle to get to the store or to get somewhere else where you had to go. So they have different functions, actually, that are practical functions related to the site. And, um, and as you think of signing, you know, the, how we can do better signage, um, some of the stories about each of the functions of these different parks ought to be mentioned. Uh, they're this little blue dots are a lot different than St. Luke's, which is actually a, a walking trail. Mm -hmm. um, quite different in, in its function. We, we actually saw when we were doing our site assessment, we saw people taking their boat out at 6th Street uh, using that ladder. It was very challenging. And um, I know the city is working on a floating dock for that location um, mm -hmm. right now. Um, I'll just add quickly, I used to live really close to there on Chester Avenue, and I would use the street and parks like all the time. And it was so nice to just sit there. Um, but like I said, it's really hard to get there now that I'm further out. And so unless you're kind of right there, which is amazing. But as to Randy's point earlier, you know, definitely love those and would love to have just more access all over the place for everyone in the city. Right. And I'm going to take Bill for the last and then move to the next question. Yeah, I just walk around uh, the waterfront as much as I can. And I try to go to some of these parks that are kind of unidentified. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, you know, I feel I feel awkward because there's no signage and, you know, a lot of them are easements on public, private property like, a, you know, Jones, you know, the, and the Bill Jones Alley. So, in fact, the owner of that ha house next door just put a sprinkler system, an underground irrigation system right in the middle of the right of public right of way uh, last week. And, you know, the no doesn't ex it doesn't <laughs> exist anymore. The city well, gave the property away. Well, they actually had the city owned 20 feet, and now they own now there's a 10 foot easement that says pu the public has a right to access that property. And yes, the, they do. And the homeowner came and put a sprinkler system last week in the middle of that right away, and they have bushes, so it's really hard to get back there. But I walk in there waiting to get yelled at. I haven't gotten yelled at yet, but uh, and then Wells Cove is like you have to really have a it's like a treasure hunt trying to I, try to find where Wells Cove is where. Somebody put a floating dock that blocks the ability for the a water tax or anybody to land, launch any boats there. And then I was I always walk into SAYC because the Planning Commission made a finding that you know public water access needs to continue to exist, and the city kind of negotiated that away. And I went there a couple of weeks ago, and I got yelled at, and the guy said he was going to call the cops if I didn't leave the property. Property, and I said, but the Planning Commission said that I have a right. Uh, to have water access and he said i don't know anything about that i'm going to call the cops so i walked away from that now gated property that we, we used to have access and legally we're supposed to continue to have access so i don't know i just it, I, without signage and without a clear definition of what we can do at each location right. we're just going to continue to lose uh lose more water access i fear there is a court case for wells cove does anybody know whether that's completed or not <laughs> won or lost there is a date of a hearing I plan to go. I think a hearing is in March. Um, I can, I'll, I'll uh, check my dates and I'll put it in the chat when, when the hearing starts. It's a three day hearing in the, in the court up, up at Church okay. Circle. Okay. Because that is an important, an, an important access. And, uh, but that's you know, the fact that like you said, Ellen, uh, people used to launch kayaks there and now we, again, the city seems to have negotiated that away. You know. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and it, you know, it, it, it ticks me off. I was going to use a different word because <laughs> okay. because I know the history on that, uh, on how that came about, and they've just really ignored it, just ignored it. It 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 is for public access. It always has been. That was the original intent. Yeah, so definitely here.
but it's going to be heard in court. So <laughs> the judge will decide. No, that that legal standing is definitely great to have because um, it has set precedent, you know, for the city to move forward and, you know, ensure that everyone has equal and equitable access to all the public parks mm -hmm. that people but, deem that is private to themselves. But, um, the city, but the city is, is, is actually testifying against water access at that site. So um, that's yes, important to know. They're, they're the ones that are saying there shouldn't be able to, people shouldn't be able to go through the water. Mike Wilde, the city of current attorney. So it's really disappointing that the city doesn't even, you know, defend their own you know, water access point. Yeah, well, yeah. Yeah, they they took my testimony on it too. So I argued with their <laughs> with the city attorney. Well, we reviewed that whole thing with the commit environmental commission. So I would love to just hear uh, how that goes or any updates on that as it comes. I don't know where it, it will come from. It, it is in a, a well documented gap in our water access uh, existing water access network. So um, okay. I hope we can find a, a solution there personally um barbara um quickly get you and then we move on into the next thing uh, i had a quick comment about well as i said before i take care of horn point park but i have a comment about the jeremy way park which mm -hmm. is right next door uh -huh. and the we started uh complaining to the city because the bulkhead was falling in and they at one point last year stopped maintaining the park and they said it wasn't a street end park and then uh mayor buckley got involved and said yes it was their park my recommendation is that we put an official helen moyer sign at jeremy way park because there's no official sign that says it's a city park. And I've looked at the plats and the city needs to make sure they take ownership of that park. Uh, apparently they have agreed to replace the bulkhead, but it's not in the current budget. So I don't know what that story is. Uh, I don't know if anyone has looked at possibly putting a jetty in there and making that a beach access location. I don't know if that's a possibility, but I would hate to see a bulkhead put back if it can be converted to beach access. Right. So thank you. And so mm -hmm. I own um... I actually, myself personally, I did get to, while I was there in the summer, look at Jeremy's Way, um, and I saw the, the disrepair and where it's located. Uh, so that is one of the parks in which we are had inventoried and kind of noted within the current conditions. Um, and so, it, which kind of leads into our, our second question. Well, our first off question of, uh, as part of this planning process, you know, as we conducted our analysis of the existing conditions um, of all of the locations, uh, we found the good functional uses and uses that uh, where we need to be improved at, such as Jeremy's Way, in which you were stating how the bulkhead was in disrepair and there's a lot of erosion, um, and then also understanding the claims on is it a city property or not. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, no. Sam Bryce will say it isn't, and and I've argued with him on that point. It, 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 it clearly, in my view, it clearly is city property, but mm -hmm. our roads person, our state person, Sam Bryce doesn't agree, and hasn't right. for a long time. Yeah, and so in situations like that, um, with parks and street ends in mind, um, that y'all have visited or experienced. What do y'all see needs to be some improvements for the spaces, uh, you know? I just wanna add before people chime in that, you know, the big reason why we're doing this plan, I think from my perspective is that we haven't, and I think you can see it in some of the comments, you know, because we don't have this sort of documented, it, it, we shouldn't have to document it, but, you know, we haven't had a comprehensive citywide public water access plan that's basically said, you know, this street end, it 
needs to be a priority or, you know, I think coming out of this planning process, all, Mm -hmm. all these recommendations are going to be on the books and I I think it's going to help decision-making tremendously. So, um, you know, I think for what it's worth, I just want to put that out there. Uh, Francesca had her hand up and I think Randy was going to speak too. So good. Yeah, I think one really big thing would be access to like kayaks and things um, that people could use. Um, A lot of people don't have them and that's such an easy, great way to experience the waterfront. Um, So yeah, I think that would be amazing. And if there was like some staff that could be there to like teach people if needed to, um, that would be really great. I personally have a paddleboard, but it's hard to get it there. Like if you have to walk really far, or I don't know how to get in my car wouldn't fit you know so just having things um kayaks i think would be really big and so to um in order to provide you know kayak access and you're looking for potential like storage facilities um launches as well yeah i feel like like downtown like around city dock that would be really great like over kind of the section with the naval academy could be a good spot and then also at chuxton park is such a missed opportunity yeah, there was a there was the suggestion when they did the comprehensive plan for the city dock that at the end of Prince George Street, um, where the, there is a street and park, but at the end of street that there be a place where you could store your kayak if you were paddling in, put your kayak there so that you could go downtown and walk and eat and drink and get or get ice cream or shop or do whatever. Uh, so those that is a place where, um, you know, a ki- kayak holding, I don't know what you call them, they're multiple, you know, multiple heights uh, could be placed. And that was recommended by the kayak group. All right. So yeah. you just have to check as that plan goes on to see whether they include it or not. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh-huh. Uh, Rodney, and then Bart. Randy. Oh, Randy, I apologize. Sorry, dude. Oh. I don't know. I I don't have a picture. I'm not sure why. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I think we thought your hand was up, Randy, but maybe it was. Yeah, yeah, it was, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Okay, so I'll just share. So the way that... uh, you know, as a sustainability professional, um, as a natural resource management professional, some one of the best practices around determining what's most critical is a proper analysis of what's most vulnerable. And it's we can all clearly agree that people of color have the least access to the waterfront. Um, and we can also all agree that the environment um, that is most uh, in close proximity to communities of color have the, have the worst conditions. Um, and so I believe that that would lead to, the, you know, simple solution that the thing that is most critical um, is not exactly so much an expansion, but a reinvestment. And so what I believe that is most critical is that first and foremost, it's it's publicly made clear um, and advocated and the messaging of, aligns with that. Look, we are making a direct immediate and initial investment into these communities. And I think that if you don't take that route and you don't have that messaging aligned with this entire movement, it could potentially take a, a, a less of a community buy-in. And it, and it kind of seems to be very tone deaf if it doesn't. Does that make sense? Yeah, makes perfect sense. Um, Barbara? One of the things which Eric and I talked about briefly in our first discussion was the fact that it's extremely difficult to find out where these parks are. And once you get there, uh, what's allowed? And if you want to do something that's not available at that park, what park you can go to? I have a lot of visitors at Horn Point Park that want to know where bigger parks are because they've got bigger groups and things like that. So I help them, you know, find 
better locations to visit. A simple thing to do would be to put QR code sticker on the new blue maps that are available at some of the locations and then have the ability to scan that QR code that goes to information about all the parks and what activities are available at those parks and maybe even pictures. Mm -hmm. I know that's kind of a, you know, a complicated project in a way, but it shouldn't be that expensive to put the QR codes on the signs. It would just be a matter of then establishing the information online to, to back them up. But I think that would be a tremendous help as an interim gap um, and something that should be fairly cost effective. Yes. Um, I like the idea of the QR codes. Um, as part of the process that we're doing, we're creating a, a storyboard map that lists out all of the parks and what's at the parks um, to be provided on the city's website. And then hopefully uh, they'll be able to guide and direct people to understand what is at each location or at each uh, street and park um, and then develop a little bit further as a process. And I do, you know, I do have concerns mm -hmm. about some of the activities that go on at our park, you know, people building fires and things that they shouldn't be doing, but there's no... Uh, there's no signs and there's no, uh, apparently there's not even a code, a city code prohibiting the building of the fire on our beach. So uh, I know when you go on the Anne Arundel Community Parks website uh, or Anne Arundel County rather, it gives a list of what activities are available at each park. Uh, I would like to see things tightened up a little bit for the safety of, of people. And okay. at one time we had a, a group of probably over 60 people that had an event at the park, you know, which made it impossible for other people to visit the park. And it was, it was not a good uh, gathering place for such a large group. Okay. But it definitely add that into the, uh, into the notes. Um, Francesca? Yeah, another thing if you're kind of working on the signage and things, I think a really important element to include is the history of a lot of this, these parks in the area. Um, I think all of us know and are familiar with the history of Annapolis and that a lot of, especially the white kind of wealthy areas didn't used to be that. And I think that's a really important thing to kind of just say loudly. Um, and then on the other end of that is reclaiming land that has kind of been developed and taken and just uh, trying to identify any possible places where we can say like okay this this should have been protected or this should be public and the city investing and purchasing that to Randy's earlier point. Okay. Hello. <laughs> yes Ms. Moyer. Yeah in terms of signage. Um yeah. I just, the website is is good for people for people who were not necessarily online people. Um, you know, the whole West Street corridor is a signage corridor. And if you look at some of the signs, uh, not in the midstrip, but uh, as you go in and go towards the, down towards Clay Street that describe what you can see and find in that community, uh, that might offer a kind of thing that can be used in different places visually for people who are just walking or riding their bikes around to see um, what parks are nearby you could do it across from david's pub you could do it uh, um you know uh, you know along along west street um the other is you can you, you can also have a brochure that's available at the visitor center and or in communities at the local cafes or pubs or coffee shops if, if any extent any still exist that um describe where you can go to uh, just view the water or where you can go to get out on the water because those are uh, the, the diff different functions. So there are multiple things you could do for signage uh, that we don't, uh, you know, that we don't do, don't do now. Um, for, for Randy had uh, talked about, and I 
you know, I, I agree with what he's, he's, uh, what, what he is, uh, what he brought up. Um, but I also would like to know, you know, what areas he, you know, wants to, uh, wants to particular focus on, for instance, College Creek, uh, the street and park at the end of College Creek is being repaired. The end of Clay Street um, offers an opportunity. And then at the end of College Creek Terrace, the city has a 20 foot right of way along College Creek um, that could, could be utilized. At, at one time, the Residents Association didn't want it utilized, but uh, working, you know, working with them, um, you can probably find, uh, you know, things that they would agree that could be useful to them. So that is a, an area that is on the upswing, so to speak. Hawkins Cove is another. Yeah. Not completed. Yeah, certainly. I do waste, excuse me, waste signage is definitely, uh, a necessity that we've seen throughout our inventory so far. I, I like the ideas of brochures and to identify and also connecting with local um, communities in order to provide that information out to the public. Um, Randy had raised his hand as a, as a good tie-in for him to provide, you know, an additional comments to uh, Ms. Moyer's uh, question. So, but then after Randy, we'll move on to our next question. Um, yeah, just to respond, I think that uh, there are several, I guarantee you, uh, there are several, several pockets of places in the city of Annapolis that have communities of color, communities that also have uh, access to water points, whether it's through a creek or uh, even trails that could, or even walking trails that open up to a body of water. Um, and so what I'm saying is, is that maybe it's time to do an analysis <laughs> um, of these places and where these pockets are so that we can maybe look to do some development and add funds and resources to build the uh, ecological and environmental outcomes and impacts as well there, as well as uh, providing an access point uh, for for uh, some underserved communities and people. Um, as far as College Creek goes and the and the uh, uh, Robert E's Park, you know, I always say I always jokingly say this, you know, to Eric, how, you know, Robert E's Park is the uh, only park that I know water access park with direct access to communities of color. And it also is the, if you look at it, I don't know if anybody's rode past it recently. <laughs> um, it is the most underinvested park in the city, um, it, it, in my opinion. You know, it just, it, it, it could really use some work there. Um, I, I put a link in the chat for this place uh, that I visited and I suggest everybody visit it. It's called Eckington Parks. It's in DC, right when you first come in the city on the right, uh, right where the Wendy's used to be. Just go and walk through it and check it out. I think that it's a very, very, very good example of the type of level of uh, work and, 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 and quality that goes into these types of developments around parks and instituting the arts and the people in those uh, activities uh, that gives them a sense of ownership. So, um, and then also I was just gonna add that another critical point to add to this is that it's most critical um, is breaking up historical monopolies. Um, and that is historical monopolies that have traditionally and historically been able to benefit from the life and luxury and commercial business side of access to the water. Um, that is a complete divide. And we are, we're kind of touching on it here and there, but I think we're very, tiptoeing around this issue or this this serious kind of matter that took place of hundreds of years that laws and legislation and redlining and and mm -hmm. and unemployment and you know all these their gentrification played a part in why the, the, there is a such a divide um in the city that has this water access so 
Uh, you're talking about tra taxis and trolleys and talking about green infrastructure development, planting trees and taking care of invasive species trees. Um, we're talking about building trails and, and different educational signage. Um, well, I think we need to also look at that as well, which is how do we make it in a way that it breaks up these historical monopolies that are always at the table and are always had their businesses and had their input in, in the mix. A uh, prime example of that is the SAYC and what happened with that. So that's why I put that in. No, I definitely appreciate those notes and comments. Um, as we look at those communities um, and segue into our next uh, question, we are planning on doing targeted uh, community outreach, uh, particularly to our black and brown and communities in the area. And so to help them provide the same comments that y'all are providing now and also identify other locations within their neighborhoods and cities and how they reach those parks. Uh, and so with that in mind, uh, do you know anyone or of within your, you know, your sphere of itself that don't use waterfront or publicly accessible uh, well? accessible public parks uh, and why don't they utilize them, um, you know? I feel like we, we've touched on this already in some of the other questions, but um, yeah, just trying to be a little more direct. Either it's because they don't feel safe or comfortable going to other neighborhoods and they don't have the access to them or that they're say on the west side of the city where there's limited parks um, that they're not there. Uh, do you hear those concerns um, about, you know, what is there and what's not there and how they, they feel about not being able to access uh, the water appropriately? Uh, Francesca? Yeah, Francesca. Um, I will just share. So when I was in college, I worked at a camp uh, summer camp called Box of Rain that's in Annapolis. Um, and if you don't know the history of that organization, I can let you know. Um, but um, that was working with kids from communities who didn't have access. Um, and I recently connected with a girl who was a camper and is now a full grown adult. Um, and she was saying how that was like so great for her and she loved having access. And she, that was the only access she had. So she lived at Bywater and she didn't have other ways to connect. And she kind of we had that for several summers and wanted to do it. And now that she's an adult, she's like, I want to get back involved and be giving the kids that opportunity that I had. Um, and I just, there's, I can't find any way to do that. Um, and I'd love to put you in touch with her too, so you can hear more directly from her. I, that would be great. Um, because as I mentioned, we're, we're looking to do these target, uh, you know, outreaches in the community. Um, and so having that feedback would be appropriate. But there, and I know, Eric, in trying to do the survey and reaching out to, you know, the Hispanic populations and then also the African-American populations, which we did earlier, uh, we didn't receive as much feedback. And so to tie that in, do you know of ways to better reach them, um, you know, besides going directly to them um, to hear about their concerns? Yeah, so I actually have a few contacts I was going to share with Eric after this um, that I think would be really important voices to hear from and to help get that survey out. Mm -hmm. um, so there's another organization called Charting Careers that um, has like staff who are based in various communities. So I think it'd be really important to speak to those people um, who are those community liaisons. And then also, um, my neighborhood is like almost entirely Latino. And I know that I looked at the survey results and it was a really, really low rate. And I never, I, I didn't know about the survey until I heard about it at a conference a couple of weeks ago. So I'm definitely gonna try to help and get that out there. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll share some information. All right, I appreciate it. Uh, Randy? Yeah, I think, uh, I think we all kind of, I mean, do I know anyone specifically or communities? I think, you know, if I think the, the data definitely shows uh, 
low income communities uh, don't have as much access. Uh, public housing communities don't have as much access. Uh, and for my novice of the city, would you be able to identify those particular neighborhoods for me? Um, uh, I know, uh, you know around Hollis Creek, there's probably some, but just the neighborhoods to. Annapolis has more public housing communities than anywhere in the United States per capita. Mm -hmm. a fun fact for you. Um, and I'll just name them all. I mean, Annapolis Gardens, Bywaters, College Street Terrace, uh, Obrey Court, Eastport, uh, I mean, um, uh, Eastport Terrace. East Harbor House. House. That's what I'm sorry, Harbor House. <laughs> uh, they, Annapolis Woods, uh, Robin Wood, Osborne Estates. Shout out to yeah. my partner, Beverly. <laughs> um, Newtown 20. Uh, no, 20. And if you really want to step outside of the city of Annapolis, there are in the in the uh, broader Annapolis 21409, you have Mulberry Hill, Browns Woods, Clay Hill, and you have Skidmore. And uh, that's where, you know, I grew up that over there on that side of town. But okay, that's that's those are what I would say communities or uh, those that I believe had the least amount of use, uh, don't have access to use, or don't, maybe don't know how, or maybe don't even have a reason or desire to. Um, and that and that 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 lack of desire didn't just happen overnight. Um, because we all are descendants of a community that largely were commercial, uh, you know, uh, businesses in the, in the industry. Um, and we all you know, know that we all know that story. Um, and if you all don't, uh, you know, it's a very rich story. Um, and so, uh, that's and, and not to mention, we talk about those who don't have access. These are not only just people that live in those communities, it's also piece of people that are low and middle income. Mm -hmm. Okay, low and middle income earners do not have the same access to waterfront. I could talk about this all day long, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you know, they don't have the same access. You know why? Because the pricing in Annapolis is changed greatly through gentrification, intense gentrification, um, and fast gentrification, um, and effective gentrification, if you want to look at it that way. And so it has become a members-only community um, for any and all access points for the water. And everybody knows that. Um, this is why you have the challenge of you know, people getting cops called and things like that. Um, and why the first thing that people usually put up when they put up these waterfront communities in Annapolis is gates <laughs> and it blocked everybody off. You got to understand well, that there are communities that have been in Annapolis who immediately, as soon as that they got these water access points that historically were com communities of colors, water access points, they immediately blocked off the public. And so what does that lead you to? Why there's a, a large lack of interest or access or even knowing what it is or anything about the waterfront. Um, so that's that's what I will share. And I, I could go on and on about that. No, I, mean, I, I feel like from my perspective, it, the, the youth are also intensely Jesus. impacted here because mm -hmm. I, I mean, the, the Annapolis of my youth, which was 1980s, um, <laughs> candidly, um, well, everything was just much more informal and, and the demographics were different racially. Um, you did the sort of the NIMBY mentality was um, far less prolific. And um, I joke with Archie Trader, our, our director of recreation and parks, who was just, you know, running around town and could just run down a dock and jump off no matter where he wanted. And um, right. we live in a very different place where, people are intensely aware of boundaries and and it's almost like a generation of youth have been kind of skipped there you know and that they haven't had that access so i was like i'm kind of curious what you know from your experience naya um since you're working with i mean to reconnect youth to the waterfront i mean it sounds like it need, it's going to take some time but um 
Well, I think it's a lot of what um, Randy just mentioned. Um, I put in the chat um, that I know Francesca mentioned that a lot of the community hub specialists with charting careers um, actually used to be one of those community hub specialists and they do work in all the neighborhoods that Randy mentioned. Um, no longer being with charting careers though, I still mentor and work with a lot of youth in those same neighborhoods. In addition to that, also the Admiral Oaks community, which is predominantly African-American and Hispanic Latina and the parole community as well. Um, and a lot of the access to the public water is gated, or if it's not gated, there's issues with getting access. There's issues with transportation. Um, I do work closely with Mr. Trader as well. So I know that they've started to, Rex and Parks has started to develop programs where you <clears throat> have access to um, sailing and things like that. But in regards to the parks, if youth aren't signed up for programs such as charting careers, it's not as accessible and as easy. And I would say even to take it even a step further, um, it also ha it trickles down into the families as well, because it's not just the children um, that we work with in the communities that that want to have the access It's the families as well. Um, yep. In regards to fishing and whatever else you could do on the water kayaking sailing they want they would love to be able to experience those opportunities as well. And so. <laughs> Emma Fergit, uh, Forest Village, Hilltop Village, Oxford <laughs> Landing, Annapolis Walk, Greenbrier. I also left out those communities as well. Mm -hmm. Admiral Fergit as well. Yeah, yeah. Thank okay. you. Uh, thank no you. worries, Randy. That's <laughs> right. No, I, I definitely appreciate all of the communities that y'all listed out because this gives us an idea. I, in my mindset, I'm thinking like in wards, but to do direct, um, you know, targeting these communities, although they probably lay within like war three or what four or something to that nature um and then of course eric and i will be leaning on y'all expertise in order to reach out to them and set something up as the time comes closer um but in progress progressing into the next question um we, we may want to since we're down to 12 minutes maybe um six. this was this was kind of like I thought this might be a more engaging thing here. I, um, this is. Yeah. Um, so with question six, as you see, we have three distinct different parts. Well, street ends, um, there are public access easements and uh, parks that are easily <clears throat> accessible um, as it is now. But as you look at them, they all have issues within their own right of accessibility and which makes them inviting, usable, and then also comfortable. Uh, with that first park on the far left of the screen, that is Fifth Street Park, which is in a, you know, uh, in East Point uh, off of, I want to say the Spark Creek, but yeah. Fifth. yeah, Fifth Street Park. And as you can tell, there is hardly any inviting um, uses for this park. It's located off of the yacht yard. And then in the center part, we have off of uh, Northwest 2nd, uh, which is back towards College Creek and near the, uh, the Cedar Bluff Cemetery. Yeah. Um, as you can tell, this is designated, um, has signage, and then it is also has some seating. But as you look at it, it's not very inviting or a lot of people don't know about it. And then on this third park off to your right of the screen, you know, it is kept up, well-maintained, white picket fence of all. Um, you know, it does appear inviting, but as we had discussed, um, there may be some uncomfortability with certain uh, residents to be able to go into those areas. And so just to hear about how to improve the standards across all three of these parks to make them inviting to everyone um, so that they'd be able to access them. And then, you know, what are your thought processes on how to do that? Um, and then what makes sense in order to implement it and then push forward? Uh, Greg and then Randy, I have seen popped up. Um, I just was excited because I 
put a, put boats in off of uh, uh, Fifth Street, and they really need some dock cleats because it's there's no floating pier, and it to get into a boat safely, there's nothing to tie your boat to. You've got to put it in and hope right. it won't fly away from you. Mm -hmm. Uh, addition of dock piers, um, you know, making the sidewalks a little bit more accessible, things to that nature to be more inviting, you would say, on the Fifth Street side? Yeah, it would be nice if it wasn't going underwater twice a day, too, but I'm not sure we can control that. I see, but we can definitely note that as far as the maintenance of it all, um, in the particular upkeep uh, to be prioritized. Uh, uh, Randy, Ellen. Oh, Ellen. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see your hand, Miss Moore. Go ahead. Who me? L. Uh, Northwest okay. Street. Uh, that's that's just Northwest Street could be, be begin to be a catalyst for the whole area around College Creek. Um, you know, so if you had a really if you had a good uh, landscape architect or an, a park like that, could, that could look at that whole area because you've got Adams Park property, you've got the head of the street, you've got Robert Eads Park, they, the, and then you can go all the way down to College Creek Terrace where there is city property. So I would say if you focus on Northwest Street, which used to have little rowboats that people could get in, you know, to go fishing. Um, so if you design that so that it becomes a part of a mega park that surrounds that whole, you know, that surrounds that whole Creek, mm -hmm. you know, if you even go down further across from college Creek, that property is owned by in part by the state and by the Naval Academy and it's, and makes itself really um, as a focal point for, you know, for a walking trails, through the woods as well as uh, as well as boat launch, so I would be, I would focus on um, looking at Northwest Park, Northwest Street, and Park on the on College Creek as a beginning of a total plan that car that that focuses on that whole on that whole area within an exciting kind of. Um, you know, a whole city park-like uh, amenities and feel. Um, I agree on Fifth Street that there needs to be, it floods a lot, but it is a, 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 a street that could be used for launching your, your kayaks and other things, but it does need, um, it needs, if you're going to sit there, there's no interesting place to sit and, you've, and there's no place to tie up if you come in to that area. So, it needs a whole new design, but you do need a designer. <laughs> so for some of these areas that look at them in terms of the potential and the possibilities. Yes, most definitely. And with the ideas that you brought up as far as providing the seating and, you know, connecting the parks together, those are definitely the seeds to push forward in order to make the right designs and prioritization on these project parks. Um, yeah, well, yeah. I mean, the whole area of College Creek just is exciting to look at. Uh, I mean, the, the potential and possibilities there. Mm -hmm. It's just overwhelming. No. Uh, Randy? Um, so I'm going to just, you know, I'm going to just be frank, man, you know, be very honest. I mean, you look at this, it looks like something out of the 1930s. Um, mm -hmm. It looks, it needs a complete overhaul. Um, so what I would suggest you do is hop on the phone, call somebody like Echo Works, Eckington Works or whatever that place was, and ask them to come and visit each one of these sites and say how much they would charge to do a complete overhaul of these sites. Uh, and if you wanted to, if you don't know what that may look like or what it looks like, you can go and visit that spot I said, because it's a clear indication of what things should look like in the 21st century. Um, this looks like something out of a whole nother time warps. And you have to, you know, when I strategize as a, you know, because I consider myself to be a leader in uh, 
this type of development, right, around natural mm-hmm. resources and parks and, you know, uh, equity. When I think about it, I think about it in a way first of who's doing it right? Who's already doing it in a way that is effective and right. is inclusive and is uh, up to par and state of the art? Um, who's already doing it? And go and interview and meet and talk with those individuals and see how you can implement certain aspects of what they're doing. Um, so that's what I would suggest be done here. Um, do some kind of analysis, meet with maybe one to three different design, uh, environmental design companies that uh, do parks um, and, 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 and replicate that, like you said, or, or have them come and, and, and you know, have them bid. I mean, I believe that this project has a budget. If it does, then see if it will fit into the budget. Um, and and it's, it's just, I get real, uh, you know, it's just one of the, the legislation that just passed, the Maryland Conservation Act 2022 and the Finance Act that just passed. Uh, one of the biggest purposes of it was to incentivize and accelerate environmental outcomes and to replace gray infrastructure like this um, with blue and green and more state-of-the-art and more sustainable infrastructure, especially on waterfront access points like this, um, where it's, it's, it's even more of a, 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 a tricky, more of a, a detailed analysis that needs to take place there because you have to consider the rising tides and, and the impacts of climate change and things like that. So. And, um, and, and, and infusing the arts. I don't see any artwork at any of these spots and it should be full of life looking and feeling at the same time, uh, have, a, have a cutting edge feel. Yeah, if I could chime in on the arts because I think you're right uh, that all of these parks could have some really interesting art and it could be a major function that the city's Art and Public Places Commission could actually take on to, uh, you know, to promote Art in the park. I'm loving the validation that I'm hearing right now because with our inventory, we definitely survey as far as like infrastructure, green infrastructure, blue infrastructure, what is currently there, trying to understand what is there as far as art and what it's connected to. And then just hearing how we can elevate that with the ideas that you brought and connecting it to build this plan for the prioritization of potential projects that, you know, say Echo Works can, you know, make a design of. Uh, these are definitely going in the right direction and echoing what we are anticipating on hearing and seeing. Um, I see that Francesca just put into the comments uh, about urban studios and foundations. Um, Wanna, yep, I've heard of them. Yeah, they dope too. You want to expound upon that just a little bit more? And we're <laughs> actually coming up on our time, so yeah. Sorry, my mute button was hidden. Yeah, so that's um a great organization. Maisie and Kendra founded that, and they focus on like kind of this exact thing, like community green space with community input and design. Um, and they've done really cool things where they've like included youth and kind of taught youth how to design green spaces um, and included them in projects. So I think that'd be a really great group to connect to. Right. That, that is great to know. Uh, um, and if I did not get to your comments um, within the chat, I uh, do apologize, but I am taking notes and will respond accordingly to them. Uh, but, um, you know, I do appreciate y'all's feedback on what we have garnered so far. And we'll be sure to set up another focus group, which I hope y'all be able to attend. And then I'll reach out, you, Eric and I will definitely reach out to y'all as far as setting up those targeted community outreaches um, to, get, to garner your end, uh, feedback as well. Um, but again, appreciate y'all. You have a great afternoon. I don't wanna keep y'all much longer. It's lunchtime. I know you're possibly hungry. But if you have any other questions or concerns, please reach out to us. Let us know. Can I just ask a quick question? Yeah. Um, yeah, so the focus groups, are they kind of meant to build on each other or are you trying to have others with different people? So the focus group are is meant to build on each other. Okay. Um, so the questions that we develop when the first one kind of feed into this one, 
And then this one will feed into the next focus group. Okay. Um, and then, so, sorry. Oh, and then just utilizing all the, the feedback that we gained. Um, we're also going to kind of test it against the small community outreach um, and then larger plan as well to incorporate, and make sure we hit everyone and guided it correctly. And um, then in terms of the participants, sorry to interrupt, Anthony, are we just, part. we're building on, we're having some people continue. We're trying to keep the group being, we want to make sure the group's diverse and it's hard to fill these groups. It really is. Um, so I mean, we try to have some carryover of participants, but we try to bring some other people in just based on what the topic is and people who could have some perspective on that. So uh, I think the next one is going to be on partnerships. Um, probably do it in January. So uh, probably following up with some of you for that. Um, that's the plan right now. But I really appreciate all the candor here. Um, you know, th these are these are just heavy topics. I mean, I think that should be um, out there in the public and there's a lot more we can do with the foundation we have here. And um, so we have a lot of good content that'll go into the plan. Um, I appreciate everybody's contributions. And so Greg, um, that is a, a great point. Um, I think during our partnership meeting that a waterfront property owner may be in attendance as that as well, uh, just to understand, you know, their thoughts and processes on you know, how they see their parks or the ownership and rights of that all. So we'll be able to work and coordinate with them, um, you know. But. Yeah. All right. All well, right. Thank have, you. Have a good rest of your day, everyone. Right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Take care. All right.